the, the excitement in Tehran about a new Egyptian regime is great. Another hope is that the collapse of these regimes will give direct access to Iran to cultivate new constituencies across the Arab world, to build new ties at a grassroots level with organizations and interest groups, and per perhaps also new leaderships. The third ambition is that this is an opportunity to, to undermine the traditional nemesis of the Islamic Revolution, which are the Gulf, the Sunni Gulf monarchies, and their influence across the board. And finally, Iran banks its hopes on, a, on its ability to leverage popular sentiment and the anti, deep, deeply ingrained anti-Western, anti-Israeli sentiment, and uh, to leverage that with its track record of being the leader of the resistance in its efforts to, to expand its influence across, across the region. Those are the ambitions. Now to the realities. The, the realities, in my mind, are split broadly between short and longer term. I think in the short and medium term, the opportunity definitely outweighs the constraints. Barring a collapse in Syria, I think uh, the Arab awakening indeed is an opening for Iran. Number one, you have, as you can already see, just three months after the departure of, of Hosni Mubarak, you can see that Egypt is no longer part of that classic axis of, uh, that was formed against uh, Iran. They've re-established re diplomatic relations with, with Cairo. Um, beyond diplomatic relations, they're clearly also trying to build ties that are go beyond the regular diplomatic exchange. Number two, Arab politics will be increasingly factionalized. We can see it in Tunisia, we can see it in Egypt. In Libya is, is, is an extreme example of factionalization. Yemen. And factionalization is something that the Iranians are very comfortable with. They operate very well in arenas of contested power. That's, that's their, their home playing field. And they have proven their skill in Iraq, in Lebanon, and other places in the Arab world. The ability to take advantage of, of playing different groups against each other, to, to exploit op openings and existing antagonisms. So the opening of these political spaces will probably, in the short and medium term, provide the same opportunity for Iran elsewhere. And thirdly, the, the risk premium that the, the Arab Spring will continue to place on, on the commodity markets and, and oil is obviously comes at a very fortuitous <laughs> moment for Iran as it buttresses the, the, the regime with, with the increased oil revenue. And uh, obviously it comes at the expense of lower production in areas such as Libya. That's the short and medium term picture. The longer term, I think, is looks very different. And that is number one, as, as I think all, all of the co-panelists here have agreed, the discourse of this Arab awakening is one of legitimate popular grievances, the desire for a government to be, governance to be based on popular will. And that's inherently does not correspond to the Iranian model. And it's hard to see how Iran can latch on, even with the, the limited discourse of the Islamic Revolution, to, to bridge that gap, which is so, which they have so blatantly uh, violated in their, in their own 30-year history. The second point is the, the new Arab leadership that is, that is going to be groomed. I think it will take quite some time. Egypt has already shown that it, it, it can provide leader, leadership uh, beyond its borders in, in, in a very short period. I think the Hamas Fatah deal would not have come about without um, Egyptian initiative. And this Arab leadership that will emerge in the future will be inherently, I think, anti-Persian. Um, either anti-Persian because of, as an, or anti-Shia because of um, the particular bent of its leaders, or simply anti-Persian because the, of Arab nationalist sentiment and the desire to see outsiders push back to, to limit what we academics call the Middle East, a penetrated system, I think, to, to push back against this penetration by, by outside powers. And thirdly, as I mentioned and started out with, <clears throat> Iran defined itself as in opposition to the existing order, and the, the regional order is going to change. In 79, the Iranians marched, or Khomeini's slogan was, neither at east nor west. The slogan in 2011, I think, is neither 
for the West nor against the West. So the, the, the order that's going to be emerge is unclear. It's certainly not going to resemble the order that we have seen. And the last time the global order changed was in 1991, and that was to Iran's disfavor. I will close with this on one last remark. The big hopes here in the, in the each time I come to Washington, which is frequently, there's a, there's a hope that uh, the Iranian regime will see its imminent demise uh, by something similar to a, popular, a successful popular movement based on similar principles. I, I think the, the Persian, the internal dynamic, the Persian spring, so to speak, is, is separate from developments in the Arab world and it's uncorrelated. <coughs> it's purely a function of domestic drivers inside Iran. And from my short vantage point, I do not think it's, it's likely in the, in the medium term. So as such, Iran will remain, at, in terms of foreign policy actor, the Iran that we know and that we are familiar with. Thank you. Thank you, Elliot, uh, giving us the Iranian view or uh, how Iran will be affected from the, the latest developments in the Middle East. Uh, thank you all. i uh, just like to thank to all panelists. They keep, keep, kept their uh, remarks very short, very dynamic. So I want to continue our discussion uh, with questions right now. Please, uh, please tell us your name and affiliation, and keep your questions to the point and short, so then we can continue our uh, dynamic pace. Um, hello, everybody. My name is uh, Rana Islam, fellow at uh, the American Institute for Contemporary German Studies. Uh, I have two questions for you, sir. Uh, first of all, thank you for your uh, intriguing uh, input. Um, um, me as a German, I, I was uh, closely following the events in the Arab world, um, and actually German media, they were, uh, they were very quick in qualifying all these events as a call for democracy, democratic reform. I was and I'm still a bit hesitant, and I'm asking you, so is it really a call for democracy, for human rights, uh, for, for, for fundamental rights, or is it more like a call for a better economy in, in this region? Uh, so this is one thing. Secondly, um, actually, uh, I have the chance to listen to the Iranian position, to the Turkish position, to the American position. However, I missed the EU perspective. Um, and uh, you yourself, as uh, someone who also has the, the domestic um, um, in um, the domestic view on all these events, which role would you um, assign to the European Union in this regard, especially? Um, seeing that the instruments are at hand, for instance, the neighborhood policy or the Union for the Mediterranean. Thank you. Um, in regard to your first question, I don't think we can look at these movements as monolithic in any way. Um, there were um, genuine liberal democratic reformers among the people in the streets. There were um, uh, political Islamists uh, along with the people in the streets. Uh, there were people who were sick and tired of struggling to pay for their kids to go to school only so that they could work as taxi drivers and have to struggle even more. Um, what it was was really a coalition of people who were sick and tired of the status quo for, for a lot of different reasons. Um, and I think only time will tell uh, how much strength the real liberal reformers that were in the streets have within that movement. Uh, I don't think uh, we should expect to see a Western-style liberal democracy in these places, and I think it would be mistaken for us to want that. Um, democracy, I've always understood it as a system that's created by people to solve internal problems, and that's when it ends up working out the best. And I think um, over time, the Egyptians, the Tunisians, and, and, and others who have undergone these revolutions will come up with a system that works for them. Um, in regard to your second question, I, th I think it's very interesting as well, and I think a lot of people in the EU are asking that very same question and are kind of uh, tired of the limited role that they've been playing thus far within uh, the Middle East, particularly in regards to the Palestinian question. Uh, and uh, honestly, I, I, I'm not really sure at this moment within the current structure of American-led initiatives in the Middle East, particularly on the uh, Israeli-Palestinian issue, how much more involved the EU can be if it is going to continue within that umbrella. Um, it has followed the uh, American lead on uh, this issue, and unless there is an agreement about how the EU's role is going to change 
within that umbrella, I don't see it really changing much without Washington's blessing. Um, so far, particularly on the Palestinian issue, it's acted as a financier of American policies, but has not uh, been involved as much, probably as it should be, or as much as um, you know Europeans and probably Palestinians would like in the actual formulating of uh, of policy that's done more here in Washington. Thank you. Anybody? Any Quick point on the uh, on the question of democracy. I think it's a good question, but it does give me an opportunity to bring up something from an earlier meeting today, which was from a friend who had recently returned from Libya, and he was in the, in the town of Derna, and he told me about graffiti that he saw on the wall, which was, we want a country of institutions. And now, my first response was, well, that's not too revolutionary. It's not like down with the man or something, but when you think about it, it actually is very revolutionary. The idea that they don't want countries you know, ruled by men with guns. They want countries and systems of durable accountable and non-corrupt institutions. And so I think that's, uh, you know, whether we throw, you know, define our term of democracy, but I think that in of itself is across the board, I think we can say they want. I think I'd just like to make one comment on the EU question, which is, I think, what has been the, the, the source of EU influence on the global stage in, in prior decades? across other regions. I think the number one success of the EU is clearly its enlargement process, the, the, the persuasion of its democratic uh, uh, role model in, in, in getting neighboring regions to sign up for, for the European values and eventually become part of that. It's, the question is, can the EU come up with a similar tool for, for re adjacent regions without that will ultimately not be a part of the EU? So far, the answer is, uh, is is unanswered. But that's the question that comes to mind when I hear you ask, "Well, what what can the EU? What's the EU's role?" I think the EU's, EU's role is to find a tool that's comparable to its its its, its previous success and, and try to modify it or apply it in a way that it works to, to North Africa and the Middle East. They haven't done so yet, and I don't I don't have an answer for that either. Thank you all for your very insightful comments. Um, Jonathan Apikian from the Center for International Private Enterprise. Can you speak um, a little bit louder, please? Sure. Um, Jonathan Apikian uh, from the Center for International Private Enterprise. Um, I was just wondering if, uh, and I open this question up to, to each of the panelists, if you can talk a little more um, about the implications of what's going on right now on uh, the alliances in the region, and notably I think of uh, obviously Syria and Iran. Um, and if, for instance, with the new Fatah and Hamas, uh, um, deal if uh, Hamas uh, took into consideration Bashar's declining, declining, declining power um, and uh, in the, in the future of that and how each uh, actor will, uh, will play. Thank you. And your question is addressed I, I, to... Um, I open this up to any, any panelists. I can address quickly just on that Hamas. I think it's a very good one. I mean, look what are the, the future of these alliances? And I think just to address the Fatah Hamas uh, unity deal, even though it's very vague still at this point, um, it's clearly, in my view, a, a, a it's been impacted by the fact that Syria is in some trouble, uh, that Egypt is no longer as inclined to, to enforce America's red lines on this question. But uh, I think while Egypt and Iran, we could expect them to have better relations. I think Egypt competing in the on the Israeli Israeli Palestinian issue in this new and a more forward way is not something that Iran is going to be altogether crazy about. Uh, I also think that a, that a Hamas that's closer to Egypt, as I think it's clear it is becoming, is is very possibly a Hamas that's farther from Iran. I think that relationship has been one of convenience. It's been one that Hamas, in my view, is not particularly very enthusiastic about. It's one that diminishes them um, in the eyes of their uh, core constituency in, in in Palestine. So, yeah, it's needless to say very complicated. But I don't I don't I don't think this this unity deal works to Iran's benefit at all. I'm going to just say one thing. This related to um, Syria, but also bringing your question more back to an elementary level about alliance formation uh, and and how um, these states are formulating their foreign policy. There have been some people who are looking at the Syria thing and thinking that 
um, you know, an, an end to the Assad regime means a um, completely different Syrian uh, foreign policy, or a completely different um, stance coming from uh, Damascus. I really don't think that that's the case. Depending on what sort of government emerges, if there's a different government, we may see a difference perhaps in the alliance with the Iranians, depending on, on ethnic issues. But uh, barring that, Syrian interests are still going to be determined by their basic national interest concerns. And vis-a-vis -vis the Israelis, that involves the occupation of the Golan Heights. So regardless to the regime that's really in place in Damascus, it's hard to imagine that even a democracy there, this may be one of the reasons why Israeli lobbyists are working so hard right now for the Assad regime uh, in, in Washington, it's hard to see them, even as a democracy, taking a very different uh, position than the one that they do right now. Right. One of the slogans in Syria was attacking Assad for being too weak. I would just like to take the opportunity for some uh, self-promotion, um, shameless self-promotion. But I had a piece yesterday in, in Foreign Policy precisely on the, the future of the Iran-Syria alliance, in which I argued that for Iran there's, some, there's no alternative to Syria, to, to Assad. If the Assad regime collapses, that will be a, a, a phenomenal or a very detrimental blow to Iranian influence in the region. It will take years for the Iranian foreign policy complex to recover and make up for that loss. I, I, I do not think any future Syria would necessarily be more <coughs> sympathetic to, 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 the, to the U.S. or to the West, but it would definitely be less friendly to Iran. So that, that alliance is of, of critical importance to, from the Iranian perspective. Uh, for the time being, uh, I think that the cooperation between Turkey and Egypt uh, would make a difference. Uh, for example, uh, taking Hamas closer to uh, Egypt and Turkey may be less prone to uh, Iranian influences. But it's it's very difficult to uh, crash, to get rid of the alliance between Hezbollah, Syria and Iran uh, in the short term. Here, uh, the U.S. and Israeli policies will be more important than other uh, regional powers. Uh, unless there is a peace, uh, still there can be some continuation of this, the same alliances. There can be some minor changes, uh, but it will continue, I think. Thank you. And I do another promotion then. Uh, our, in Turkish, uh, we will publish a report on police rule in Syria and then an analysis of Syria's politics and how Turkish foreign policy will be affected by Syria in the next couple of weeks. Um, Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'm Ravza Kalakjikan from Howard University. Uh, my question um, it's, it's a topic I'm personally curious about. Uh, the flotilla crisis of last summer, uh, the help that was going to Gaza and it had been attacked by the Israelis. Um, I was wondering how that would play into um, this revolution, because uh, I was under the impression that although the government leaders didn't support it, there was popular support amongst them. So there's another flotilla that's going to go on, go on May, um, beginning of May, I think. So I was wondering if uh, how that would play into, or if it, it did have a role in the revolution, and if there would be a change uh, in the non-existent support uh, for the next um, eight Congress. Thank you. Just make a quick explanation here. I think there will not be any flotilla at least before the second half of June. I don't know about the later there's going to be another one after that. Or whether this flotilla issue affected the Arab Spring in the near. The, the, uh, the Israeli-Palestinian issue 
uh, was uh, under the water, is under the water when we look at the Arab Spring and slogans uh, we see dignity and some domestic problems we don't see anti-Western or anti-Israeli slogans but this is the tip of iceberg I, th I think there is an undercurrent uh, demand which are directly related to Arab mind, Arab uh, national conceptualization of their securities, their uh, interests. That is the uh, Israeli-Palestinian question. Uh, and maybe in the short run, we cannot see uh, any crisis. But in the medium and long run, we will see that the real issue in the Middle East will be the peace process will be the issue of the peace. Each actor, including Turkey and Egypt, uh, will make their uh, calculations in accordance with this issue. Uh, and the US and Israeli uh, policymakers should reconsider their future policies. I don't think it's necessarily clear that the flotilla contributed in a specific way, I would say, it did add to, I think, the well of resentment, um, you know, just particularly among Egyptians, who I think were pretty clearly angry at the, the role that Egypt under Mubarak was playing in enforcing the siege. Um, and it certainly contributed to an even further breakdown in relations between Israel and Turkey. Um, but yes, I, I agree. I mean, even though I think there was there was a consensus among many of the demonstrators that we're going to focus on domestic issues, clearly, if you look, there was evidence of anger at the United States for decades of support, anger at um, the Israelis over the continu continuing op occupation. So it's clearly an issue that's there, um, and it, it's going to come to the fore sooner or later. I, I would just say this in regards to. Uh, when you think about the flotilla, this is something that I, I wrote about um, um, the time that this was, was taking place, in fact, a few days before the incident. Um, what the flotilla symbolizes and, and, and is, uh, is a group of civilian activists uh, taking action to make change on issues that states and, and the regimes which are dominating those states are not doing anything about. Uh, and in that sense, the spirit behind the flotilla is very much similar to the spirit that brought people into the uh, streets in, uh, in Cairo and elsewhere. And it should go without saying how unpopular the Egyptian policy uh, as it relates to, to Gaza was uh, in Cairo and Okay, we're going to Rafa first. I am Rafael Danziger, and I'm with APAC, and I'm with one of the boys who allow these that you to be referring to. just want to assure everybody that uh, nobody at APAC, nobody in any boys who allow I know has ever worked for Bashar Assad. Bashar Assad is seen as the interest of life of Iran. Support of Hezbollah, support of Hezbollah, and of Hamas. So I believe that everybody that I know of, and any of the boys who love it, is very happy to see democracy uh, emerging in Syria, emerging in all the Arab countries. Everybody I know in the boys who love is believes that democracies do not fight democracies, and therefore it would be good for Israel, for the United States, of course, for the Arabs themselves, if democracy actually ever emerged in any of the Arab countries. I would, I would take you at your word, sir, but I would also say that lobbies uh, have shown an interest in the past to display a public face in the front of the that are not always the same. If you have any evidence, I would challenge you to provide evidence of any such uh, Challenge you to provide any evidence of any pro Israel lobby that what, actually what worked it? for it. To, is there one sound Just, you know, I don't want to address the specific question, of, I understand your point, I think, but I think we should recognize, I mean, it's clear that the Netanyahu government and many Israelis are very nervous, even though they are very friendly to the idea of democracy. Um, the question is, what, become, what comes between now and then? Um, a period of uncertainty, a period of chaos that could very well be exploited by, as I said, a number of actors. Um, and I was actually in Israel at the Herzliya conference during the, the lead up to, to you know, the, when Tahrir Square really, the week leading up to Mubarak stepping down. And 
it was clearly the, the, the nervousness and the fear was thick in the air, not because Israelis are hostile to democracy, because, but because they fear what could come in the interim. You know, on this I really completely agree, that there is a nervousness and uncertainty, not only in Israel, in the United States as well, as you can hear from the remarks of some of Thank you. Uh, Issam Ibrahim, a lawyer from Syria. Uh, my question to Mr. Dura. Uh, as a Syrian citizen, I, I think the Turkish uh, stand is good uh, towards uh, uh, the Syrian revolution lately uh, in comparison with the European and the American and the international community, community uh, shameful uh, stance. Uh, my question, uh, is there any Turkish fears from the Syrian court's uh, ambitions? And uh, do you think that uh, the Liwa uh, Skandarona case will appear again after the success of the Syrian revolution? Thank you. Do you think uh, the uh, uh, that Liwa Skandarona case will appear again? after the th success of the Syrian revolution. And uh, the next point, uh, is there any Turkish fires uh, from the Syrian court's ambitions? Uh, the, the current situation uh, seems uh, problematic uh, in in the relations between Turkey and Syria, simply because of uh, the uh, dilemma that you want economic, cultural, social uh, integration with Syria from Turkey's side, also from Syrian side, and some problems relating related to uh, Alexandria or uh, 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 sorry, Iskandaria and. Uh, Water issues are, I think, uh, for for the next uh, five ten years out of question. If any democratic government comes to Syria, and Turkey will can work uh, this government better than Syrian regime, because uh, democracy brings complexity, brings different uh, representation of different interests, and Turkey, as the only consolidated democracy in, in the region, can influence and can be, uh, benefit and can contribute to this process in Syria. And the uh, some uh, border problems and some water problems will be secondary. Uh, Turkey can work uh, with a democratic Syrian government in better terms, I think. I speak very loudly. <laughs> well, Hanadine, I'm just wondering, um, there's been some vague ref uh, references as to why Turkey may be reluctant to participate in the overthrow of Assad. Could you be more specific as to what, you know, what the issues are that is uh, creating a serious uh, sorry, Turkey's reluctance? And also from uh, Yusuf, could you tell us what your prognosis is for Bahrain and what you think is going to happen uh, short term or long term? Let me start with Yusuf and then continue with uh, sure. um, it, it's, it's hard to see a change in the status quo right now in Bahrain, uh, although it's, it's very disturbing uh, to imagine. But it's hard to imagine anything uh, The powers that be, particularly uh, in the Gulf, have determined that they would not allow Bahrain to become an Iranian foothold. That's the way that they see it in the Gulf. Uh, and um, the, the fact that they're willing to go to the extent to enact the GCC uh, defense pact 
based on an interpretation of a, an attack on the, the regime from inside their own country by their own people, I think, underscores the extent to which they're willing to go to make sure that it stays that way. Uh, and uh, as, as unfortunate as that is, uh, I, I don't see it changing very much. Let's see the uh, yes, from the early days of the Arab uprisings, Turkish policy, policy, foreign policy makers are pushing the uh, Syrian regime, Assad regime, to make reform. Uh, let's consider these events as very significant, very important, and uh, you should make some reforms. But until now, there are some improvements, but also uh, repression and massacres until now. Turkey was not able to persuade Assad regime to make uh, further reforms. This, this, this is something deteriorating the relations between uh, Turkey and Syria. Syria is not Libya. Uh, if there is a civil war in Syria, this, uh, this would uh, be detrimental to not only Turkish interests, but also even to U.S. interests, to uh, Israeli interests, Lebanon will be in a, in a chaos, and Iranian uh, uh, power relations will be on the scene. Uh, so, and at the same time, Turkey has a Kurdish problem, very related to this issue, and we, Turkey will have a humanitarian problem, some refugees, will come to Turkey. So this is a very issue, uh, serious issue which has many, uh, multiple uh, faces, multiple, multiple implications. The only option for Turkey seems to be pushing more Assad regime for reform and for ending this, uh, killing the massacres. But if this doesn't work in the near future, I expect some open, uh, harsh words against Assad regime uh, from Turkey, because the issue is becoming more issue of humanitarian uh, problem, not just democracy, but it is becoming more uh, serious, and Turkey cannot uh, keep eyes uh, closed. Okay, there is one more addition to my. Yeah, uh, thank you very much. I want to add something to this regarding Turkey and Syrian relations. Now, in the successful revolution of Egypt and Tunisia, uh, needed to decide, stay on the sideline, basically, watch what the Turkish, which party is progressing and trying, and then they decided to repeat. Now, due to the sectarian nature of the state apparatus in Syria, okay, uh, if the revolution is not successful, basically, I'm foreseeing some sort of like a total collapse of the state apparatus. So, if this happens, what is, is there kind of a specific thinking policy in Ankara regarding the possible humanitarian intervention, possible military intervention? Because this is not going to be about protecting Turkey's interest or US interest or something. This is going to be a huge, uh, like a sinkhole over there that people need to do something about it. And we are talking about 25 million people. So just like, is there a specific kind of policy other than accepting flow of refugees that are coming to Turkey. Did you do anything? Oh, uh, unfortunately, uh, I am an academic, not a policy maker. Uh, I'm not, uh, I cannot give and I don't know the details of such operations. Uh, but Turkey, of course, Turkey is uh, not only a soft power, but also a hard power in the region. Uh, but I don't know what, what are the implications of this fact. <laughs> Thank you. And I just want to add one more point. I think Turkey as a state do not follow the humanitarian intervention discourse, which requires some kind of principles to mutually intervene to certain positions. So in that sense, even if Turkey would do something about those, that would not be called as humanitarian intervention, because that's a completely different discourse. That's a completely different set of, uh, completely different mindset. And uh, I just wanted to make that difference. Mike? Uh, I'm sorry, please. Yeah, sorry. 
Hi, Igal <coughs> Schleif from a journalist, analyst covering Turkish affairs. Uh, question to Elliot and uh, Buenaitin on um, Turkey's Iran relations and in light of Syria, um, because it strikes me that a lot of the same principles are at work in both relations in terms of Turkey's deepening relations with both countries is that in the sense that somehow engagement with Turkey, engagement itself leads to reform, moderation, um, has an impact. Um, I think this is the belief would happen in Syria. It just seems that the schedule got changed. Um, but I'm wondering if, if what's happening in Syria is leading to any sort of reckoning among Tur Turkish policymakers. If you see this in terms of the relationship with Iran, where you know I think a kind of reckoning will also ultimately come and may not come on Turkey's schedule either it, over the nuclear issue or some sort of internal change there. Um, so, you know, that's a question. Is, is what's happening in Syria somehow, do you see it having any impact on the thinking on the relation with Iran? Uh, I mentioned uh, two loose axes uh, in my presentation, but these axes, uh, in these axes, the poles are not Turkey and Iran. Turkey and Iran has cooperative relations since the late, uh, since the Ottoman times, since the medieval Ottoman times. I cannot expect any uh, conflict uh, in the future. There can be some conflict of interests. Still, there, there are there are some competing uh, aspects of both uh, countries' uh, foreign policies. Uh, when it comes to Syria, in, in Syria, it, the problem is more serious because, uh, as Fevzi mentioned, uh, there is a problem of uh, regime transformation, and the uh, existing architecture of regime is not uh